All right, let's open up our Bibles to James chapter 4. Be looking at verses 13 through 17 today. James chapter 4. So we'll finish up chapter 4 and we'll get into talking about rich folk next week. But, uh, and one thing I want to mention real quick um, starting at the first of the year, my plan is to, is to finish uh, James by the end of the year. Starting at the first of the year, what I'd like for us to do is all read through the Bible in a year, and I will preach every Sunday and Sunday night about what we've read that week. And so that way, that gets us all going through the Bible in a year. I think that will help us as a church and as a congregation. So that's what we get to look forward to next year. So, James chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. It says, Go to now, ye that say today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year, and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live, and do this or that. But now you rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you so much for your word. Lord, it's a blessing. And Lord, I, it's a shame to us at times that we disregard it the way that we do. And Lord, I just pray that you'd help us to look to your word for the our direction in life, our path for our life, Lord, your will for our life. And Lord, I pray this morning that nothing is said that's outside of your will. Lord, help me to remember what I need to say and forget what I don't. Lord, we ask all this in the name of your precious Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So we're at a passage, if we read this objectively, it should and could be convicting to every single one of us. No one is exempt from it. It's talking about making plans. And it's talking about the difference in the way we plan for things and the way God plans for things and how that affects our lives. What it amounts to is do we plan according to God's will? And that's what James is talking about here. Now, he's still referring to humbling ourselves in the sight of the Lord as we saw earlier in verse 10. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and He shall lift you up. And the rest of the book of James is talking about how we need to humble ourselves and it gives practical application to that. And we'll see in this passage as well those same attributes. The difference between our pride and our humility. Now, I think it will help us immensely if we look at this passage and want it to help us. But if we don't, it won't. And it's like that with any passage of the Bible. If you want to learn it, if you want the help from it, if you truly want it, God will help you with it. But if not, you're going to forget it like anything else you might forget. You know, I'm absent-minded sometimes, and so... I walk into a room and forget why I'm walking in there. And if we're not ready to understand Scripture and know what God has for us, it's going to same, the same thing's going to happen. By the time we close the book after we're done reading, we're not going to know a thing from it. But James is speaking of someone who has much in common with us in this day and time. He's speak, speaking of people who are making plans, and within those plans, God is an afterthought. So he's talking about, hey, you folks that go into a city and say today or tomorrow we will go there and continue their year, buy and sell and get gain. Okay, so basically he's talking about the fleshly focus of our plans. And the majority of people, especially in the nation of the United States of America, their plans are focused on one thing, getting gain. Getting money. Their focus is their monetary income. Their hope, their faith, their comfort is in their financial gain. And I dare say that 95% of Americans, American Christians are that way. 
It starts from the time that we enter high school to the time that we die. We make all of our plans. We arrange our days. We arrange our life, where we live, what we're going to do, on what money we're going to make. We want the American dream. All right? We want to we want to be rich. And even in a lot of churches, they push that. Hey, if you work hard, you can get all these things you want to. And you can. But it comes at a sacrifice. It comes at the sacrifice, a lot of times, of a person's discipleship. That's... And that's what James is talking about here in this passage. We'll go more to it in a minute, but we can kind of look ahead to chapter 5. And I said it's going to be talking about rich people next week. And it's talking about people who have sold out everything in their spiritual life to gain money. And God says there's nothing for them. We can go back to what Jesus said. It is harder for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, you keep on, and and Jesus doesn't say it's impossible because the disciples ask him, well, then who can be saved? He said, nothing's impossible with God. And so when we look at how those fleshly focuses of our plans the way they arrange our whole life. We have to sacrifice our relationship with Jesus Christ to get a lot of those things. And when we look here in verse 13, he's talking about people making plans and going into a city and and buying and selling and getting gain. And so when we look at that, you're talking about getting gain. Well, you have to do something for that. You've got to buy and sell. And so they're talking about for a year, their focus of their life is buying and selling, getting gain, gaining money. Their gain is their pride. And we see in verse 16, it says, that, But now you rejoice in your boastings, all such rejoicing is evil. One of the greatest things that we boast about in this society is our job, the money we make. And it's become a detriment to the church. You have shysters out there pushing prosperity gospels, saying, hey, if you follow God, God's going to make you rich. You have life abundantly. And I always think about, uh, well, evidently, you know, people like Paul and Peter and them didn't have a whole lot of faith because they didn't have that abundant life that some of these folks talk about. They wasn't rich. They didn't have everything go their way. But this passage shows us the fleshly focus that we use to plan our lives. I mean, you think about it this way. You look at people that move across the country. Or let's just, let's just make it uh, smaller. Say you move 100 miles. What percentage of those people move that distance for work, for money, compared to those that move that distance for God? and to better serve Him. There's a wide gap there. And what James is talking about here in the fleshly focus of our plans, he goes on in verse 14, whereas you know not what will be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. And what this does is it shows us the futility of our lives and the plans that we make in it sometimes. Because if our focus is on gain and and comforts in this present life, all that's going to be gone. Everything that we can look out and see right now is temporary. There is nothing here that will last forever except our soul. James tells them, says, Your life is a vapor, appeareth a little time, and then vanisheth away. Book of Job, chapter 7. It's a good book to read about how fleeting things are. Verses 6 through 9, he says, My days are swifter than a weaver's shovel, sh- shuttle and are spent without hope. Oh, remember that my life is wind. Mine eye shall see no more good. The eye of him that has seen me shall see me no more. Thine eyes are upon me. I am not. As the cloud is consumed and vanisheth away, so he that goeth down to the grave shall come up no more. 
And so Job is talking about how our life is like wind. It's like a cloud. It's like a puff. It's nothing. I heard a preacher one time. He said, your life is but a vapor. He said, you know what that is? That's it. And we put all our time and energy into a vapor. The time that we are here physically. And I think the, the quicker that we can remember, like Solomon and Ecclesiastes, that all the things of this world is vanity, we may be better off. We look in the book of Genesis when Jacob goes down to Egypt to be with Joseph and the rest of their family. Pharaoh asked Jacob, he says, how old are you? Jacob was 130 years old at that time. But his words were, few and evil have my days been. 130 years, Jacob looked at it and said, that's not long. That's been a fleeting time. Few and evil. I've had hard times. And basically, he's just saying, it's like, look, my life is nothing. And so James is talking about how futile and vain it could be to make plans sometimes. Now, I will say this. I'm not saying that God's against plans because in the book of Proverbs 14, 15, he says the wise looks well into the matter. Okay, but we've got to remember what's our plans based around. Is it based around our wants, our desires, what we want to do, or is it based around God's will? I'll have to say, working in the funeral business now, you really realize how quick your life can go away. I've been there a month and a half, of, of roughly, and I've seen people come into that funeral home that was, had plans to get married the next week, but now they were dead. They make plans for a lifetime, and in one moment, they're gone. Proverbs 27, 1 says, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. That's true. Turn with me to the book of Luke, chapter 12. And uh, I will say this, I think just about the whole chapter of chapter 12 in Luke is a, is a good commentary on these verses because we're going to come back to them again later on. Verse 16, he says, And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? He said, This will I do. I'll pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall these things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. And so we see that in this parable the story of a man who had great gain and he needed more room to keep it. He needed more places to store his stuff. That was his focus. But then God tells him, that's foolish. Thou fool, your life is required of you this night. What's going to happen with that stuff? Because you can't take it with you when you go. And again, what I'm saying is the plans that we make, the activities we do, the things we do, so much revolves around stuff. And that includes money and how to get it. And so he tells us in James, he says, For that ye ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or do that. And I think it's beneficial when we remember really how much God holds over our life because we think that we can... We can control it. You know, Jesus said Himself, how, how many of you, by worrying or, or effort, can you know, turn your hair back to a certain color or add a stature to your height? None of us. But we feel like we have our lives under control so much. 
Matthew 6, 33 and 34 tells us, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Now what that says, there's going to be trouble. You can count. When you make plans, somebody's going to throw a wrench into it. You, you hear that phrase, uh, if you want to hear God laugh, tell Him your plans. And that's absolutely the case. So we've looked at how we typically have a fleshly focus to our plans and then how futile those plans are. But then when we see what the rest of James is how faith should drive our plans. That if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or do that. And now, it doesn't say what this or that is, and I'm going to read into this a little bit. But doing this or that, I think what James is talking about, doing the things that God has commanded us to do. Not worrying about where we're going to get money and where we're going to get food and where we're going to get clothing because we'll talk about that here in a minute. But what it's saying, our plan should center around our faith. And we see that in verse 17. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Hebrews eleven six 6 says, Without faith it is impossible to please God. And so our plans should center around our faith. The fact that we know what is good because we can open up the Bible and God has shown us what we are to do, what we are to do daily, how we are to think, how we are to pray, how we are to act. But we don't do it. We often wonder a lot of times what is the Lord's will. Now, I can say it's the Lord's will that we be saved, and it's the Lord's will that we be holy, and it's the Lord's will that we be moral, and it's the Lord's will that we be active, and it's the Lord's will that we be disciples. It's the Lord's will that we go out and do something. And here, James is talking about doing something. You know, even when we recite the Lord's Prayer, we, we say, you know, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're asking for the Lord's will to be done here on earth. But then we have to ask ourselves, do we really want the Lord's will done here on earth, especially in our individual life? Do we want to sacrifice what we want to do for what God wants us to do? So we have to look at ourselves. When we pray that, do we mean it? Do we want to allow God to intrude on our plans? And so looking at here, we've looked at our fleshly focus, how futile that is, and then how faith should drive our plans. Our faith in God. So back in Luke 12, we look at 22 through 31. Now, and I'm going to read these, but I think they have a message, and I'll just be honest. I have to look at this regularly nowadays. I do. Because, well, we plan our lives about the ability to make a living, to get gain. But God tells us if we follow Him, He's going to take care of that. So we look at Luke 12, verse 22. He says, He said unto His disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, neither for the body what ye shall put on. We've got to remember, He's just coming back from telling them, Look, this guy who wanted to build more barns to store his stuff had no thought for the things of eternity. He worried about what he would eat, what he would wear and all that. And so look on verse 23. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. Consider the raiments, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? And which of you with taking thought can add to his stature one cubit? If ye then be not able to do that which is least, why take ye thought for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow, they toil not, they spin not. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothed the grass which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast in the oven, how much more will he clothe you? O ye of little faith, and seek not ye what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, neither be ye 
of doubtful mind, for all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. But rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. So we look at the contrast in James from somebody that's not seeking the kingdom of God and saying, looking in 17, there's people who know they ought to seek the kingdom of God and know what that entails, and they know that it's good, and they know that God requires it, but yet they do it not. I think in this day and time, American Christians are lazier than they've ever been. They're more slothful than they've ever been. They're more apathetic than they've ever been. And that includes us. We know what to do, but we outright don't do it. We know that we are to bear one another's burdens. We know that we are to follow Jesus Christ. We know that we're to be like Paul and bear the mark of the gospel in our lives. He said he bore it in his body. We've been studying that in Acts. But he said that in Galatians. But we go about our lives. We're worried about making a living in this temporal world. We've filled up our lives with so many things that take us away from serving God and working the gospel. And it's saddening. It's troubling because I've been just as guilty. Hey, uh, we're going to, as a church, do this or that. Well, I've got to do this and I've got to do that. And, you know, I can't, I don't have time or I've got to take kids here. And we just, we sacrifice doing the things of God for doing the things for ourselves and for our kids. And, and it's, and it's not that there's no benefit in doing some of those things, but when it takes away from serving God from preaching the message of Jesus Christ, that's a problem. So back in Luke 12, on this commentary on this passage, Jesus goes into saying, talking about the faithful and wise steward, whom his Lord shall make ruler over the household. He said, verse 43, Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Of a truth, I say unto you, that he will make him ruler over all that he hath. And so he's talking about leaving his possessions in charge of a servant and taking care of them, being a good steward. And when he comes back, he say, hey, you've done a good job of what I've given you to take care of. But we go on to verse 47. He says, And that servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with a few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall much be required. And to whom men have committed much of him, they will ask the more. So James says, if we know to do good and do it not, it is sin. And Luke tells us in his gospel that Jesus said, if you know to do good and you know what to do and you do it not, you're going to have to pay for it. And that's a hard thing to talk about and think about sometimes, but that's the gospel. That's what Jesus Christ said. If we know to do good and do it not, it says we'll be beaten with many stripes. And what I always equate this to, if somebody that's sat in church their whole life and has never been born again, they will die and they will go to hell and they will have a, suffer a more severe punishment than somebody who never heard the name of Jesus Christ because we live in a society and in a place where we're exposed to the gospel constantly. If you walk in this church, you are exposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ that is true to what the Bible has revealed. And if you walk out of this church lost, you'll be more condemned because you didn't pay attention or you didn't do the things that you know were the truth. Such it is in this day. And so the title of this sermon is called The Best Laid Plans. And I can guarantee you the best laid plans is not our plans. It's not what we want to do. But they're God's plans. And they, a lot of times, don't line up with what we have in mind. I can promise you, 20 years ago, doing this on a Sunday morning was not in my plans. I can promise you that a lot of things I do now was not in my plans. And I still question those at times. But I have to go back to Luke chapter 12 and God said that, look, I'm going to take care of you if you do my will. 
And so when we follow our own will, that's that pride we've been talking about. That we want to do the things that we want to do. And to follow God's will is the ultimate act of humility. What does God have for us in our life? Because, look, we are the most prideful and selfish people in the world. Because everything is generated around what we can gain from it. Everything from what products we buy, anything from where we live, anything from where we go to church, what can we gain from it? When what we ought to be looking at is what can I give to God? What can I do for God? That's how we should start every day. God, what can I do for you today? What do you desire me to do? But yet, a lot of times we wake up and we go about our day and we go to work not even thinking about God, not giving Him the last thought. And in this day and time, it's definitely evident because we see how the world is. And so, every plan that we make, every decision we make, and I've said this before, it ought to be taken to God. Everything. There's nothing too big, too small to ask God about, hey, what's your will for me in this? And that doesn't mean everything will be easy when you make that decision. But I can promise you, in the end of it, there will be some joy. So as Cleet and Cheryl come up for the invitation this morning, if you have any prayer need, any, anything that you want to uh, just pray about, if you're lost, whatever it is, you know, you know you can come to the altar, people will pray with you. Just don't leave here with it. Let's stand and sing. 358.